by Govanen. Welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek, and this is a follow-up video to last week's in which I talked about the soft retconning of Isildur, and which is also connected to Indeep Geek's video on Isildur, which I will link to both of those videos in the description of this video, so you can go watch those. And the purpose of this video is to talk specifically about what I think would probably have happened if Isildur had survived the disaster of the Gladden Fields and managed to keep the ring in his possession. So in the last, episode, in the last video I talked about how if we only look at the Lord of the Rings, Isildur's character seems pretty suspect. But when we include the Silmarillion and Unfinished Tales materials, he starts to look a lot better. I'm going to start this video with the assumption that we have all of this material as background and that Isildur has the best possible history so that we can give him as much credit as possible in answering this question. The question then becomes, what happens if Isildur manages to escape the Gladden Fields? Does he give up the ring or try to destroy it, or does he keep it more like Gollum and end up becoming some kind of a tyrant ruling over Arnor? And the easiest way to look at this question, I think, is by making a comparison to Bilbo, who, as Gandalf tells us, is, as far as he knows, the only person in history ever to willingly give up the ring. Now, in fairness, there's only a handful of people who ever had the ring in order to give it up voluntarily, and those at that time would have been Sauron, who of course wasn't going to give it up, Isildur, who died before he could, Gollum, who didn't even know what he had but killed to get it, so it's a fair, fair bet he wouldn't ever have done that, and Bilbo himself. So there's only four people to go on and really Bilbo is almost the only useful data point. Uh, but Bilbo does in fact give it up voluntarily, but as Gandalf points out, he needed all of my help to do it. So, if we consider Bilbo as a point of comparison, what do we get when we look at Isildur and consider the parallels between these two characters? Well, the first major thing that comes to my mind is the lies that you tell yourself about the ring. Everybody who possesses the ring tells themselves a lie about it in some way. Gollum's, of course, famously was that it was his birthday present, and he came to believe his own lie. He had it for so long. Bilbo's lie was, I won it in the game, and it was mine by right, which was... Not so much a lie that he told himself, but a lie that he told other people to prevent anybody questioning his right to the ring, as Tolkien retconned The Hobbit to make that story work. Isildur's lie to himself is that this is a wear guild for my father and my brother. The wear guild concept is that, you know, you kill my family member, I have a right to claim something from you in payment of that. Now, the reason the Were Guild thing is a lie is because Sauron, by the time he takes the ring, is dead. You, I mean, the death of the person who killed your family is kind of the vengeance that you get. You don't get to then also claim a Were Guild. So that's not really honest on Isildur's part. The next major point of comparison with Bilbo is in what manner is the ring acquired? One of the things Gandalf tells us about Bilbo and which makes him able to give up the ring and less corrupted by it is the fact that he acquired it basically with an act of mercy. He specifically tells Frodo when Frodo says, it's a pity Bilbo didn't stab the vile creature when he had the chance, meaning Gollum, of course. Gandalf said it was pity that stayed his hand and be assured that if it's because he acquired the ring with mercy that it's had so little effect on him, despite his possessing it for over 60 years. And this doesn't really do a whole lot to affect Frodo, but it tells us something important about the ring. The more dangerously you acquire the ring, the more ill intent you have when you acquire the ring, 
the more likely it is to corrupt you and to really get a hold on you. And again, we can kind of use Gollum as a counterpoint to this because Gollum, of course, straight up murders Deogal to get the ring, which is about the worst possible thing you could do. Isildur sits somewhere in between these two extremes. He doesn't acquire the ring unjustly. I mean, Sauron needed to be dead. That Nobody would dispute that. And so killing Sauron is not something that Isildur was wrong to do, assuming, as I argue in my video about who actually killed Sauron, Isildur's act of cutting the ring off actually is what finished him off. But even if we go with Elendil and Gilgalad killing Sauron, Isildur then did nothing. And his taking the ring... Taking the ring is also something that needed to be done because it needed to be destroyed and it needed, you know, it. there's no sense in leaving a, an object of that nature on a corpse for some orc warlord to come across later either or for a ring wraith, say, right? There's no good reason to leave it on Sauron's hand. So acquiring it itself is not a problem in Isildur's case, but he's also not acquiring it with a an act of mercy or anything like this either. I mean, he's just, you might call it a, an act that's kind of mercenary. I mean, he's just, you know, looking out for himself in some sense because he's taking it as a wear guild, which he doesn't have really a right to. But the, I'm, you know, I'm hesitant to use that whole argument as the motive for taking the ring in itself because it's really almost more like the reaction to, hey, Isildur, you should probably destroy that thing. Nah, I'm going to take it as a wear guild. It's, I'm not sure we can necessarily say Isildur taking the ring, at, you know, in the first instance is necessarily an act of just pure greed. So, somewhere, like I said, in between Gollum and Bilbo on this scale is where Isildur falls. Taking the ring is not a, a wrong act, per se. The lie he tells about, him, about it to himself to justify it after the fact, that's dangerous, but everybody does that, including Bilbo. So the fact that he didn't murder Sauron unjustly is certainly a big point in Isildur's favor. The fact that he didn't acquire it with an act of mercy toward anyone it's, it's not a plus, but it's not a negative, let's say. A final point to think about here is the length of time that Isildur had for the ring to work on him. And he spent a few years in Gondor after acquiring the ring, setting the kingdom up, and then turned north, and then was killed, ultimately, before he could do anything with it. This is a very short amount of time compared to someone like Gollum or even Bilbo, Bilbo possessed the ring for 60 years, and it had really grown on him, and he recognized that it was kind of a problem, and he needed to get rid of it, and he still needed all of Gandalf's help to give it up voluntarily. Isildur would have an advantage here because Isildur would have only possessed it for a few years and probably not done much of anything with it to get really attached to it in the way that Bilbo did, before he comes to his realization at the Gladden Fields that I made a mistake taking this ring and I should probably hand it over to the wise for them to do whatever they need to do with it. So here Isildur does have kind of a distinct advantage because he doesn't have the time for the ring to really get a grip on him the way it does almost everybody else. The one thing I will say, though, about his uh, his kind of seeing the light moment in the Gladden Fields, I don't necessarily think that this is a really strong indication that he's definitely going to be able to give up the ring if he escapes and makes it back to his home. And the reason I say that is every time we see Frodo use the ring in or get, you know, really ultra possessive about the ring in some kind of scenario where he then has a chance to look back and be like, oh, what was I doing? That was, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, he does this with Sam several times. He gets really possessive about the ring and gets ugly about it. And then he'll come to himself and realize, oh man, I, that wasn't me. That was the ring. I'm sorry. And I have no reason to doubt that that is actually the case. Frodo is not being ugly out of his own character. That's the ring being, you know, the ring. So Isildur is 
I, I would be tempted to say, in kind of a similar situation in the Gladden Fields, he has gotten to a point where the the counter reaction to his possessiveness has kind of caught up to him, and now he's realizing, oops, uh, yeah, this was a bad idea after all. That doesn't mean he's going to have the strength of will to give it up, because Frodo never really has the strength of will to give it up in the end. I mean, he even tells Sam, I can't give it up to you, right? I, I can't do it now. I have to carry this thing to the end, and there's just no getting around it. I If I tried to give it to you, I would go mad. Which is a really interesting thing to say, considering his entire goal is to ultimately give it up and drop it into a molten pool of lava. Uh, but anyway, the point being, is Sildor's self-awareness in the moment of the Gladden Fields is like Frodo's self-awareness after he says something ugly to Sam. It tells us that Isildur still has, you know, some, he's got his good motives and he's got, you know, whatever good character he's got, but that doesn't mean that he's in the moment where it matters going to be able to do the right thing with the ring. It Arguably, nobody could ever do the right thing with the ring if they were standing at the very crack of doom and knew what they were holding, because that's the height of the power of the ring, and therefore it might not, you know, it might not be within the scope of any mortal, and by mortal I am including elves, you know, I'm talking about the, the humanoid races of Middle-earth, it might not be within their scope to ever throw the ring into the fire, Something like a Gollum intervention by, you know, Divine Providence has to happen for that quest to be fulfilled. So, Isildur, in the moment of the Gladden Fields, recognizes what he has to do. Just as Frodo recognizes intellectually that he has to throw the ring into the fire, but he's unable to do it. And he continues, even though he keeps apologizing to Sam, he keeps doing the same kind of thing. And so, Isildur having the same kind of apologetic moment, not apologizing to any particular person, but recognizing his own wrong in that moment doesn't mean he won't do the exact same wrong thing later. So I don't think that that's necessarily a strong indicator one way or the other. Anybody who possesses the ring could intellectually realize what is you know the, the right thing to do in their situation and yet be incapable of doing it. So when we look at the overall parallels between these characters, Isildur and Bilbo, we have some parallels that are good for Isildur, some that are not so good for Isildur, and some that are kind of maybe a wash. So would he be able to give up the ring? Well, Gandalf said that Bilbo only gave it up with all of his help. Mm. Does Isildur have any such help? Potentially, yes, because he lives in the north near where Elrond lives, and Elrond is one of the wisest and best elves in Middle-earth, and, you know, you could also get Círdan involved, you could get Galadriel involved. There are many of the wise, capital W, who could help Isildur to do the right thing in this scenario. And so whether Isildur could give up the ring, I think, is a really knife's edge balance question. He might be able to do it. He's got a really strong character of his own. He has the advantage of not having it in his possession for years and years and years and getting really attached to it. He even has the slight advantage of knowing what it is and knowing to be wary of it, which Bilbo doesn't have. I forgot to mention that. That's another thing that, you know, between the two of them, Isildur has a little bit of advantage there because Bilbo has it and just thinks that it's a cool trinket that he acquired on his trip and yay, it's mine, and okay, it's in, it turns you invisible, very handy. Isildur knows from the start that it's made by Sauron, it's dangerous, and it's, you know, he, he knows it's bad in some way, but it's only after the Gladden feels that he comes to full realization, mm, yeah, it's really dangerous and something needs to be done about it. But that's better than Bilbo. Frodo, you know, this is a parallel with Frodo. Frodo knows from the beginning of our story, basically, he doesn't know for the first 17 years of his ownership of the ring, but after that point, he knows what it is, and he knows to be on guard. That doesn't mean he does a great job of it all the time, but later in the story, the longer it goes, the more on guard he is, and the more he is able to resist the ring. 
Isildur would have that advantage from very early on with a very strong heroic character to start from. So I think if you got, you know, if he actually made it back to Arnor and then went and visited Elrond, he probably could be talked into giving up the ring. There's a fairly good chance of that. Now, here's where the the what-if scenario splits into kind of two paths. One is, what if Isildur gives up the ring? How would that work? The other is, what if Isildur can't ultimately give up the ring? How would that change history? And then, you know, since ultimately the whole arc of the story is ultimately the ring goes into the fire, if Isildur keeps it, how do we reach the end point of that arc? So if we're looking at Isildur is able to give up the ring, how would that how would that work? So the thing about the ring is it corrupts anybody who has it because they want to come to possess it and use it. That's just the nature of the thing. I think if Isildur and the Wise got together and understood what they were doing, you know, one of the things that I think might be a useful theory in, in a situation where, you know, Sauron is defeated, Mordor is basically empty, there's not huge armies of orcs wandering around, Isildur would need to give the ring into the keeping of some, you know, essentially just a messenger to take the thing to the you know, the fires of Mount Doom and toss it in. And I don't know if the, this is such a weird idea to even think about, but I think the best way to do it would be to just drop it into a lockbox, lock it, don't ever give anybody the key, give it to a messenger and say, hey, there's this thing in here that needs to go in the fire. You don't need to know what it is, you just need to go chuck it. And then that way the person taking it doesn't even know what they're holding, and I would tend to think wouldn't even know, you know, wouldn't even be affected by the ring. I, I'm not aware of anybody ever being affected by the presence of the ring if they don't know that it's there. They don't have to know what it is in its nature, but they have to be able to see it. Like, I've, I've, there's no instance in the story where somebody merely from proximity becomes corrupted by the ring. That just doesn't happen. Like, Boromir is corrupted by the ring because he knows the ring is there. He knows what it is. Faramir isn't corrupted by the ring just because it's sitting there inside of Frodo's shirt. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't work. And even once he finds out what the ring is, he isn't corrupted by it because that's, you know, Faramir's an awesome character. But, you know, I mean, if Frodo spent three months in Ithilien with... Faramir and his rangers, and never told anybody that he was carrying it, would, you know, all the people in the rangers battalion that Faramir is leading, would they all become corrupted by the ring that they can't see and don't know is there? I don't, I don't think that's how it works. So in theory, you could put it in a lockbox and just have somebody take it. Of course, this raises the question, why didn't they do that at the Council of Elrond and just, like, give it to somebody completely random, you know, and say, hey, take this to Mordor? Well, Okay, you could make that argument, but does anybody really think that with Sauron coming back to power that you can just talk some random person to take some random object that they don't even know what is to Mount Doom to throw it away? And I don't think it works as well in that scenario. It works in this scenario because the trip to Mordor and, and to Mount Doom is a relatively safe one at this stage in history because Sauron has been defeated and his armies have been all but vanquished. There's still roving bands of orcs, obviously, and that's how the Gladden Fields disaster happens, but they're kind of random scattered and not in Mordor. The Mordor armies have all been pretty much wiped out. So it would be a lot easier to do. Now, the person carrying it would be like, this is kind of weird. Why am I carrying a lockbox that I'm not allowed to open? Uh, so, I mean, you might have to think of a different scenario because, you know, the curiosity might be a problem. But I think this would be the safest way to get it done. The other, you know, uh, otherwise you have to just al allow for the fact that somebody is going to be taking it, knowing what it is, and get to the cracks of doom, and be tasked with throwing it in, and, you know, probably, like I said earlier, not be able to do it, because at the height of its power in the heart of Sauron's realm, the ring is just going to overpower the, the will of any, you know, elf, dwarf, or man. So... 
that's one scenario. Isildur gives up the ring to some random messenger to take, you know, and that is the end of it. The more interesting scenario, and one which I think might be more likely, is that Isildur finally is unable to actually give up the ring. I, I just, I have a feeling that at the end of the day, Isildur would not be able to give up the ring in the way that Bilbo did, and I think a lot of it comes down to that act of mercy thing. Because his acquisition of the ring was, it was morally neutral, but that moral positive that Bilbo has in his acquisition is actually really, really important, I think. And so Isildur's act of acquisition being morally neutral is, you know, it's neutral, but in some way it's a huge setback. So I think, therefore, that more likely he's going to end up keeping the ring for himself. And what that means is he's going to effectively become immortal. He's never going to die. He might eventually become a wraith if he keeps using it too much. But in any event, he's going to be a never-dying king of Arnor, and he's probably going to assert his rule over Gondor as well, and probably eventually try to expand his realm and incorporate the elven kingdoms nearby and everything else because he's just going to become a tyrant if he holds on to it. He's going to become corrupt and he's going to do bad things. Which means ultimately there's going to be wars that result from this and sooner or later you're going to get like Battle of the War of the Last Alliance version 2 where the elves and maybe Gondor have to team up to fight Isildur and eventually probably defeat him and start the cycle kind of all over again. Isildur is going to have to end up being killed, and it wouldn't be super hard to do this. I mean, you may be thinking, well, wouldn't he just put on the ring and run away and never get caught? Well, you might think that, except with, you know, high elves still living in Rivendell, who can see both the spirit world and the normal world because they can see the Nazgul, they'd probably be able to see Isildur too, and so that that doesn't actually work in Isildur's favor. So they would be able to find him and eventually, you know, do something to him. Now, either kill him or capture him and take the ring or something, one way or the other, by force they would have to do this in the same way that Isildur ultimately took the ring from Sauron by force. Now, that would either result in Isildur's death or the breaking of his mind, unfortunately. So Isildur would not end up in a good place as a result of all that. But you would then start the cycle all over again, and whoever ends up with the ring would be in kind of the same position as Isildur at the end of the Second Age with the choices of, okay, do I just take this thing and go chuck it in the fire? Do I keep it? Or... You know, so the way that all turns out, that's just kind of the same story all over again. And you just kind of rinse, repeat, until you get somebody who actually manages to get it to Mount Doom and chuck it into the fire. Those are, you know, I mean, there's the scenario becomes different depending on the situation. Like, does the person who kills a Sildur also have a father and brother who get killed in the war and therefore who wants to claim it as a wear guild and then... You know, he loses it in the river, and then it gets found by some other, you know. You could imagine it working out in numerous different ways. But the point being, if Isildur keeps it, that's, I think, what happens. He becomes a tyrant, rules over Arnor and Gondor in ultimately a really heavy-handed way, and then creates a rebellion against himself and becomes, you know, just a different ring lord. Fortunately, not as powerful as Sauron and not able to muster, you know, huge armies in the east and orcs and all this stuff because that's not within his capacity, I don't think. But, you know, he would certainly build up his power over time and, and try to become as strong and impregnable as he could. But it would be a lot easier to take him down than it would be to take down Sauron. And so that, I think, is how that eventually gets resolved. He becomes a tyrant, tries to you know, rule over people in a really not-so-nice way and is ultimately brought down in some kind of a war and either killed or the ring is taken from him and then however that goes from there. There's any number of ways that that could go. So 
those are the two scenarios that I think could potentially play out if Isildur, you know, manages to, to survive the Gladden Fields. He either, because of his strength of character and the help of Elrond and others of the wise, is able to give up the ring and hands it off to somebody to go destroy, or he is unable to do so, becomes a tyrant, and then, you know, creates essentially the same kind of situation that, you know, he took the ring from Sauron in where somebody else takes the ring from him as a result of his own nastiness leading to rebellion and, you know, more war. So that's my theory on it. I think, you know, and I mentioned this in my previous video, but I think Robert over at In Deep Geek is a little bit on the rosy side with his estimate of Isildur's chances in this scenario. It's not impossible. Like, if, if we compare Isildur to Bilbo, there is a real chance that Isildur could do it. I think In Deep Geek is a little a little too ready to give Isildur benefit of the doubt and credit. It's not that he's not deserving of some, but I think it's a little bit little bit harder to make that call than just like, oh, well, in Gladden Fields, he's awesome, ready to go, and he's going to give up the ring. Eh, I don't think it's quite that easy, but there is an argument to be made that he could do it. So that's why I think there's two possible outcomes for this. So that's my theory on what would happen if Isildur managed to keep the ring. Let me know what you think of these theories in the comments. If you have a third alternative, we could discuss that as well. I'm totally open to the possibility that there might be another way that things might go down. These are just the two that came to my mind. Do like and share the video around. Subscribe and hit the bell icon on YouTube or subscribe on Rumble or Odyssey or on Podcatchers. You can follow me at Twitter at JRRT Lore. You can also join my Discord server, link in the description below as well. And you can support me over at Patreon. Until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek signing out for the Tolkien Lore channel. The Marie.